Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marissa Darden. We are talking today for the first Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association Real Talk, Building an Ohio Sentencing Database. Again, my name is Marissa. I am a principal in the white collar group at Squire Patton Boggs in the Cleveland office. I'm also the co-chair of the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association criminal law section and a former state and federal prosecutor. I'm excited to present this 90 minute panel and be the moderator. We're joined by a distinguished group of subject matter experts and are going to talk today about the need for Ohio to create a uniform sentencing database that would allow the state judges at every level to share felony sentencing data and streamline data collection across the state, improve workflow, create a reliable means of comparison information to study the value of sentencing patterns in our state. A few housekeeping matters about the webinar. If you're watching on Zoom, you may submit questions to me as the moderator through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. The panelists will do the best do their best, excuse me, to answer questions as time permits. If your question is not answered, the panelists have agreed to review the remainder of the questions and the CMBA will attempt to answer them and create some public forum to uh, follow up with those questions that were not answered today on the line. If you are watching on Facebook Live, welcome. You may submit questions in the comments section to the moderator. If you paid for CLE credit as part of the 90 minute program, you will receive a survey via email that you must fill out in order to receive and finalize your credit. And finally, if you did not already receive some written materials as part of your sign up for this uh, webinar today, you will receive an email afterwards that has and includes some additional documents, information, links, et cetera, related to our topics today. I'm gonna introduce our panelists and then also introduce are the Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court, who's going to say a few remarks. Our panelists today include Ohio Supreme Court Associate Justice Michael Donnelly, who was elected to the Supreme Court in 2018 and has served since January of 2019. Justice Donnelly was a Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Judge for 13 years prior to taking the bench as an Ohio Supreme Court Justice and as a former Cuyahoga County prosecutor and civil litigator. Judge Jean A. Zamuda was elected to the Sixth District Court of Appeals in November of 2018. Prior to serving on the appellate court, Judge Zamuda served as a judge on the Lucas County Court of Common Pleas in the General Trial Division beginning in 2006. Prior to his service on the Common Pleas bench, Judge Zamuda served as a judge for the Toledo Municipal Court and was in private practice for several years before taking the bench. Judge Ray Hedden serves on the 8th District Court of Appeals and has done so since January of 2019. In private practice for 30 years before serving on the court, Judge Hedden worked as bond counsel and served as counsel in a number of prominent works projects across the state of Ohio. Sarah Andrews is the director of the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission, an affiliated office of the Supreme Court of Ohio, which is responsible for conducting a review of Ohio's sentencing statutes and sentencing patterns and making recommendations towards necessary statutory changes. Before her appointment in this role, Sarah is a veteran, a veteran of the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, holding a number of leadership positions there most recently as the Deputy Director of the Division of Parole and Community Services. Again, as I mentioned, before we begin our panel, we are honored to be joined by Ohio Supreme Court Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor. Chief Justice O'Connor is the 10th Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio and the first woman to lead the state's judicial bench. Elected as a justice in 2002 and reelected in 2008, Voters elevated her to Chief Justice in 2010, and she was reelected in 2016. She served as a private lawyer, magistrate, common pleas judge, prosecutor, and Ohio Lieutenant Governor. Chief Justice O'Connor has led significant judicial reforms and a myriad of topics, and is a regional and national leader on government responses to America's drug epidemics and smart criminal justice reforms. So thank you, Justice O'Connor, for joining us, and we'd love to hear your remarks. 
Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation to be here and thank you to the Cleveland Metro Bar Association for doing this and all the partners that you've drawn in for this program. I think it's extremely important. You know, over the last 25 uh, years or so, there's been a call for a comprehensive uh, usable data system, both for collection and research. And um, this, this call has, I, I guess I would say, had limited uh, response, limited progress. The establishment and the widespread use of databases uh, that are truly useful uh, for the fair and equitable administration of justice continues to elude us. The efforts so far could uh, easily be called haphazard Ohio, in both in Ohio and in other states and across this country. The problem doesn't just rest with the judiciary, although we do have a large uh, responsibility here, but law enforcement, prosecutors, probation offices, corrections, all the way through that chain, there's been a lack of actionable and standardized data and collection methodology that would allow us to be better informed and to gover govern more effectively. I believe that this situation should be an embarrassment to all of us. I know I'm embarrassed about it. Metrics for the monitoring and evaluation of performance are at least as old as baseball box scores. In the business world, databases are taken for granted. Real-time tools that look backward to measure performance and then look forward for trends and for the starting points of improvement. Let me see your numbers. You know, that's a routine request uh, for just about everywhere in the business world, but rarely in the criminal justice system. Truly adequate figures just are not there. So it's time for us to answer the call of so many task forces and commissions and blue ribbon panels uh, and, and get something done. Uh, here's a look at the demands uh, for the database creation in our state and around the country. Um, and I, you know, I have to say uh, over the last, as I said, 25 years or so, uh, you can go from state to state, which I have looked at their efforts as well as the national level and seeing uh, the, same, the same response, recognizing the need, recognizing, uh, you know, putting together a search or a task force or a commission, uh, coming up with recommendations and then having those recommendations uh, uh, ignored. You know, Senate Bill 2 uh, in the 121st General Assembly, uh, effective July 1st, 1996, uh, Section 4 in pertinent text says, the General Assembly hereby requests the Supreme Court to adopt a rule that requires a court of common pleas to maintain in a court file that is accessible to the public the following information in regard to each case in which the offender is convicted of or pleads guilty to a felony. The case number, the name of the judge, and the race, ethnic background, gender, and religion of the defendant. And that has not been done. Admittedly, it was a request, um, but it has not been done. Uh, the uh, Ohio Commission on Racial Fairness uh, and the task force, or the uh, task force that, uh, or commission task force that came after it, um, and this was 1999, made a series of recommendations the overarching recommendation for this uh, uh, commission was statistical data uh, as to race be collected as to pretrial bond decisions. Statistical data as to race be maintained in connection with sentences, including community-based sentences in all criminal cases, including misdemeanor, juvenile, and traffic cases. Um, the task force reiterated the commission's recommendations and no action has been taken. Law enforcement agencies maintain statistical data as to race in connection with all arrests. The task force, that was a recommendation. The task force noted separation of powers issue on this, of course, um, but there is an effort through um, OIVERS, uh, Administration for Department of Public Safety, and, um, uh, which includes the defendant and the victim race data. Of 575 law enforcement agencies covering 81% of the uh, Ohio's population submit the data. A Department of Public Safety is presently working to expand um, uh, OIBER's data to include the use of force data as well, including the race of the arresting officer. 130 law enforcement agencies are currently submitting that additional data. That's a start, but again, um, it's not comprehensive. Uh, another recommendation, the Supreme Court should require that common police courts adopt a form to uh, 
uh, for purposes of complying with the requirements of SB2. Um, and that's post-conviction relief for felony convictions claimed to be barred uh, based on racial disparate treatment. No action has been taken on that. The Supreme Court should enforce the mandate of SB2 that the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission monitor the effects of SB2. With regard to um, uh, sentencing and uh, no action has been taken on that. The Supreme Court should engage in a person it should engage a person or entity with the necessary skills and experience to design meaningful methodology for the collection and compilation of relevant data as to race at all relevant stages of the criminal justice system and monitor the collection and compilation of that data. No action has been taken on that. The Supreme Court should establish the responsibility for implementing the recommendations contained in this section in the office of the court administrator and no action has been taken on that. So we've got a multi-pronged problem here. We have uh, race data collection, which is hit or miss, haphazard, as I said. Um, we have a series of repositories of that information. We have law enforcement, we have prosecutors, public defenders, courts, probation, and corrections. And uh, the problem is both the fact that the data is not comprehensively collected, and then we move on to data sharing, and that data is not in the format, even if it exists, it's not in the format for to be aggregated and um, researched on a, um, a statewide basis uh, at all. Uh, in fact, it's very limited even within the, uh, the bases that do collect it. So we've got a lot of work to do. The question is, how are we gonna do it uh, as we move forward? Um, is there a political will to do it? You know, people say, well, why hasn't this happened when this recommendation has been around for almost 25 years? Um, there's a lot of reasons. There's, you know, priorities have shifted. Um, there was uh, the cost. There's a lot of pushback because of economics. There's been pushback, quite frankly, um, by members of the organizations that I mentioned, the judiciary, law enforcement, uh, probation, prosecutors, et cetera, about sharing, well, collecting that data and then sharing that data. That has to stop. Um, this is the time to do something. I think the political will is present at this time. The momentum is present. Um, and we are going to do something on this. I've got two and a half years left on my term, and this is my priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Hopefully we'll be able to answer some of those questions today or at least provide a framework for how we can move forward. I, I agree with you, but politically, the political will is there more so than ever before. And we're excited to sort of delve into this topic today and try to come up with some of the answers to the questions that you pose. Um, for those of you watching on Zoom, we are going to launch a quick poll question. You can answer it as soon as the poll launches and you should be able to get a notification at the bottom of your screen. If you're on Facebook, we will provide the poll question in the comments section. So feel free to answer the one question as we move through the panel discussion today. Um, we're gonna start with uh, Sarah, who I believe will give us a bit more color and context to uh, the actual sentencing commission's work in this area and what the sort of logistics of the the database would look like. Sarah? All right, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Chief. Your leadership on this issue is appreciated. Um, we look forward to moving the points you've made from presentation to reality. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today among this esteemed group. Um, there's so much to talk about in a short amount of time and so I'll try to be brief. We, as mentioned, uh, we do have some resources and reference material for you guys, so please take the time to look those things over. Especially the Sentencing Commission publication called The Data Disconnect. I think that it sets the stage for us being here today. And also, please check out the Sentencing Commission website. We have a variety of resources and information there. It's important for us to frame the issue. We aren't here to really ask why do it or to talk about why we can't do it. Instead, we are here to talk about why not do it and how can we do it. And the it is a felony sentencing database that can, can and will enhance public confidence, trust in the system by making information accessible, consumable, 
and reportable. We believe we can do this in a way that is efficient, reduces duplication, and does not fiscally burden local government. Justice Donnelly will share his perspective on why it is so important. Judge Zamuda will give us specifics on how it can actually get done. And Judge Hedden helps us make the connection between data informed decisions and economic realities. But first, let's talk about sentencing. As stated by my colleagues on the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing, sentencing is the linchpin of the criminal justice system. Sentencing influences and is influenced, is influenced by events that happen both earlier and later in the chronological progression of a case. Understanding the relationship between those events is crucial. As the chief mentioned, available sentencing data focuses on few outcomes, such as the number of people sentenced to, to a prison term. They do not tell us about punishments other than prison or about the process of sentencing, like factors that influence the sentence. What we need to remember is the destination is important, but to understand the true dynamics of sentencing, so is the road. Ohio sentencing and criminal justice data, as the chief pointed out, is disparate, mismatched, complex, and lacks the capacity for comprehensive analysis. The only available aggregate data is prison population. We don't currently <clears throat> have statewide or aggregate information about the people who don't go to prison. Knowing more about the people who don't go to prison is essential for us to develop informed, well-reasoned public policy and to ensure fair sentencing. The development of a felony sentencing database gives us the power to compile and organize mountains of data collected in unconnected paper files and system and presents a pivotal moment. A moment that is our best chance to reflect the reality consuming courtrooms across the state and to effectively transform those eye popping details into informed judicial and public policy decisions. With a sentencing database, we can craft narratives that don't confuse the dramatic with the important. We can resist the temptation to focus only on one attention grabbing headline and not on the larger, slower, and perhaps the more subtle stories. There is no entity, agency, or group better positioned to lead this effort and compile that data than the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission. And let me tell you a little bit about us. We are an independent, objective group of people whose only vested interest is to enhance justice and ensure fair sentencing in the state of Ohio. And in fact, the ind indispensable role for sentencing commissions is to assemble and analyze all the data about the inflows and outflows of the criminal justice system needed to make sensible cost benefit decisions and promote smart, effective use of resources and ensure measured proportional responses. As the chief mentioned, in August of 1990, the legislature created the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission as a permanent body in response to four concerns. And I don't think any of these will surprise you. Um, and we're talking about them today. Prison population and cost, overly complicated sentencing laws, racial disparity in sentencing, and a lack of judicial discretion. Today, the commission is a 31 member group chaired by Chief Justice O'Connor. And since its inception, the commission has provided impartial and consensus driven analysis and development of policies and practices that maximize public safety, reduce recidivism and equalize justice. The commission is really the only long standing agency that routinely brings together judges, prosecuting and defense attorneys, behavioral health professionals, academics, corrections officials, law enforcement, victims, advocates, community corrections experts, and others with a direct interest in criminal sentencing to bridge the information gap among criminal justice partners. <clears throat> we, as you may have seen in the Chief's Independence Day uh, statement, we have pushed for a uh, modernization of our statutes for the Criminal Sentencing Commission, which includes both changes to membership and duties. That reorganized commission um, really helps and uh, changes the membership to be uh, a, a diverse, inclusive group of experts who can be responsive to the distinct needs of jurisdictions. 
while pursuing a level of fairness and rationality that can be particularly elusive in the legislative heat of the moment. The change in duties notably, among other things, will codify us as a criminal justice agency and obligate us to develop and maintain a statewide criminal sentencing database. In closing, the Sentencing Commission should be held accountable for proposing, vetting, and advancing the best and most impactful interests for fair sentencing and sound public policy. The expectation is simply stated, proactive recommendations that change lives and deliver on the fundamental purposes and principles of sentencing, which you will hear more about from our other panelists. Creating a felony sentencing database in Ohio delivers on that expectation and can provide unprecedented level of information for practitioners and policymakers. The information can be used to leverage resources and programming to improve outcomes for those involved in the criminal justice system and help inform judicial decision making. In other words, robust data and information translates to safer, fairer, and more cost efficient criminal justice system. We need to move from asking why to why not, especially now. And I have to ask, is there really any other industry that would tolerate 30 years of missed opportunities, 30 years of complaints about the lack of data, or accept that what limited data there is, is being cobbled together to paint inaccurate pictures? We've suffered too long from what I call bureaucratic paralysis, where everyone is doing something, but nothing gets done. We can change that. Thank you again, and I'm grateful to be here today. Thank you, Sarah. There's a, actually a question from the audience, and it was a question that I had also, about whether there's been any talk to include sentencing database information or collection information regarding misdemeanors as well as just the felonies. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, we see that our, we need to start small. <laughs> Even though it's been 30 years, we're starting with the felony sentencing database and we'll transition to other places in the system, such as municipal court. Yeah. And it's also somewhat could be viewed as a compromise in some ways, right? Because the felonies in numbers are much smaller than the misdemeanors, which may be more costly and more time intensive in terms of corralling all of that data, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, we'll talk to Justice Donnelly. Justice. Good afternoon. Uh, first, let me say it's an honor to be a part of this uh, most important discussion. I want to thank Chief Justice O'Connor for her support and leadership on this issue, and, uh, and Sarah Andrews for uh, uh, raising the clarion call for something that I believe is long overdue, as stated, but I don't think you can overstate the importance of what we're advocating for today as something that will advance the criminal justice system in this state. Uh, and if we go in this direction, we will be joining a national movement in other states that are seeking the same thing. And uh, what we're talking about is providing more transparency to our criminal justice system that um, needs it sorely at this time. And as I've always said, transparency, uh, the ability for the citizens that we serve in the judiciary is the most important uh, factor. Uh, that is their ability to discern that the criminal uh, justice system is working correctly. Uh, and this is what promotes public confidence in the system. Public confidence is diminished when our citizens believe, or vast majority of our citizens believe, that the outcomes of the criminal justice system uh, don't arise from necessarily the application of the rule of law, which requires uh, fairness, proportionality, and consistency, but rather the impression that the outcome of your criminal case, whether you're an accuser or the accused, is largely dependent on the judge that is assigned to your case at the arraignment room. Uh, our trial court judges in the state, and I was one of them for 14 years, are invested with huge, large amounts of discretion uh, in terms of deciding what sentence they uh, want to impose in any particular criminal case. Just for an example, when I joined the Supreme Court, we reviewed a case, uh, the state v. Susan Gwynn from Central Ohio, which involved a 55-year-old woman 
charged with burglary and theft-related offense, numerous offenses. Uh, she negotiated a plea agreement, and she showed up at her sentencing. Uh, the, the sentencing judge had the ability to give her probation that day. Uh, the state uh, advocated for 42 years. The defense lawyer advocated for probation, and the trial court ended up imposing a 65-year sentence. So that's just an example of the wide discretion that, that takes place. Um, and why this is so needed is uh, there is no ability and our appellate court judges feel like they're, when, when a sentence like that comes up, they feel like their hands are tied by our laws in order to provide meaningful review of a case like that and decide does the record support that sentence? You're gonna hear from Judge Hedden and he's gonna tell you uh, about two important laws in our sentencing uh, structure. Well, actually they're supposed to be the cornerstones, 29, 29, 11, and 29, 29, 12. What are the overall purposes of sentencing? And that's what judges are supposed to be taking, in, uh, taking into account when you sentence people. But we really, I, as a trial court judge for 14 years, I didn't have a, an ability to view all my past sentences and make sure that the sentence that I was delivering was consistent. Um, and so what, one of the questions you raised in one of your prior emails, uh, Marissa, was why would people object to this? Why does this make people uncomfortable? Well, I think transparency uh, shines a light on things that need to be changed in the system. And um, I know everybody here is interested because you signed up for this uh, program, but if if you want to see what I I consider uh, exhibits A and B, uh, which will uh, provide irrefutable evidence uh, for the ne necessity of a database, uh, please Google Florida's broken sentencing system, and it will show you an article from 2016 in which a, numerous investigative reporters did what we want to do on a statewide basis. They did a study of all the judges in a certain jurisdiction in Florida, and they compared similarly situated cases. And what they found was very disturbing. They found that people of color were receiving much more severe sentences than white defendants for the same crime, same backgrounds. And this was one of the things that spurred down there the need for the collection of data and that They've been leading the way and hopefully Ohio will join in that. I also wanna mention another article uh, that you can Google that I think is uh, very informative in terms of why data is important. And it had to do with a high profile federal case, the Paul Manafort sentencing. And I, this took place fortunately before I spoke uh, in front of the sentencing commission uh, last year. And it provides a perfect example of why we need this data. In that particular case, people, there was a national discussion on why he received what a lot of people perceived to be a light sentence, because the government under the federal guidelines was asking for a 19 year sentence. Well, I studied that case and what it demonstrates is that the lawyers, the defense lawyers for Manafort had the information that our attorneys in this state do not have right now. They said, hold on a minute on the record with the judge before you, before you sentence this defendant, we're gonna show you 17 cases, some of which are yours, in which someone pled to the same crime, uh, same set of facts, same background, and they were vastly decreased uh, sentence. And that's how he, they were able to keep these sentence down, sentences down. We have a mass incarceration problem in this state. We have 50,000 people incarcerated in the state of Ohio. That's the equivalent of every man, woman, and ch child living in uh, the city of Lakewood, Ohio. Our, with the most dense population. So I would encourage you to do that. Our, our sentencing laws require that our sentences are consistent with sentences imposed for similar cases. That's just not a good notion or a good idea. That's written into our laws. But right now, our judges do not have the information uh, to deliver those. They don't know that information. It's like, uh, it's like being in the dark. Uh, and I think after what took place in, um, in Minneapolis uh, and uh, th that lighted a spark that this system, not, not just from uh, interactions with police, but the whole criminal justice system needs to be addressed because um, we need to address the problem of disparate treatment of individuals um, of color 
And this would provide a tool for every system, judges, defense lawyers, uh, and prosecutors, so that they can be consistent. This is something that no one really should be opposed to. And when you ask the question, Marissa, about what, what's the argument against it, I haven't heard it yet, but I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe someone would raise, raise it during this discussion today. But those are my thoughts. Justice, you know, there's been another question from the audience, and it's also a question that I have, and maybe you and Sarah could discuss it a bit, which is, you know, can you kind of walk us through the mechanics of, of this? Who would be responsible for collecting the data or aggregating the data? Um, will it be made public? Is there a budget associated? You know, have, have these details been flushed out? Well, I, I'll let Sarah handle, she's been uh, at the forefront of this, but I can say um, there's a number of moving parts in the state. Uh, right now, uh, in Northeast Ohio, right after Minneapolis occurred, a group of lawyers uh, formed a organization, and they, they're calling it Lawyers Take Action, because they wanted to do something um, positive in, in this response, and they met and they embraced this idea of data collection as the positive response uh, to what took place and to address the inequities uh, in our system, and it's headed by Attorney Laura Hong. If you're here in Northeast Ohio, you can contact her, and she's working with uh, Professor Aisha Hardaway uh, at the at the Social Justice Institute, and they want to start on this collection process. The state public defender's office is already uh, with a sophisticated database collecting this. So, the goal is, I think, to get all these people who want to be involved in the process of data collection to work together, and then funnel all that information to a, uh, a centralized database that would be under the auspices of the Sentencing Commission. But I'll let Sarah add on to that. Thank you, Justice Donnelly. And yeah, uh, first, I guess I'd like to have Judge Zamuda talk, because I think he's going to talk about some of those mechanics and what he presents to the group. And then if, those, if that doesn't answer the questions, I'd be happy to come back, circle around. Thank you. Judge Zamuda. Thank you, Marissa. Um, it, it is indeed an honor to be uh, part of this panel and this really Im important discussion that we're having today. Uh, I particularly want to thank the Chief for uh, teeing up and framing uh, concisely the issue that uh, is confronting us presently. You know, this data collection piece that we're talking about it comes at a time in our community, as I see it, where there's a confluence of interests. Uh, um, I certainly think that the social unrest that we have been exhibited throughout this country should be viewed in part as a sign of dissatisfaction of what some view as an arbitrary enforcement of our society. That's why this data collection piece um, is uniquely timed in terms of answering and allaying the fears that the system is not uh, properly uh, administered. Uh, I've been uh, honored to be selected as the chair of the ad hoc committee that has created literally a, a felony sentence judgment entry that if adopted by the felony courts in Ohio would be a uniform entry that would have the data collection points contained within it from which this data could not only then be submitted but then analyzed and, and uh, discussed and, and, and vetted. The import of this data collection cannot be overstressed and I'd like to before I get into the mechanics, address three specific uh, bases for that. I think most laypersons think we already do this. They think, oh, this is all stuff. It's the court system. You all know what, what the record is. And, and I, I think they would be surprised the extent to which the trial judges uh, do not have as much information as they would think they have when a defendant comes before him or her for processing of a particular case. So I think there's a fundamental uh, import to educate the public. We don't have, the public should be aware that we do not have the free exchange of information and it's systemic. It's systemic because we pride ourselves as a state where we are county bound. We have 88 counties and we cherish the fact that we are local in how we manage our affairs. Cuyahoga people are Cuyahoga people. I from, come from Lucas County. We are Lucas County people. Not only do you have that siloed effect then because we're insular to our respective counties, but you also have 
the separation of power silo effect. You have the executive branch, which is in this instance, the prosecutors. You have the judicial branch or our court system and the legislative branch, you know, which passes the laws and each one of them is insular in their managing of their respective systems, which I think um, only causes the data not to be shared equally. Data collection also can be helpful for the education of lawyers, you practitioners who appear in front of the trial judges on a, on a daily basis. Um, when I was a trial court judge, I loved when sentencing memorandums were submitted to me to flesh out who that defendant was, to flesh out the record, the story of the defendant. The prosecutor does a nice job and the probation department through the pre-sentence report does an excellent job in fleshing out the facts of the case, the victim perspective, uh, and the state's perspective. But sentencing memorandum is not required. And I enjoyed cases where we had those sentencing memorandums. Well, well, this data, if you think about it, is just one little facet of providing that data on a consistent and regular basis. What most practitioners don't understand, and certainly the public doesn't understand, is that the data that is used in conjunction with the fairness of the sentence imposed at trial becomes the data that becomes necessary and a key component of an analysis should that defendant be presented uh, in another court on new charges. Because the prior record and the prior conviction becomes integral in the determination of bail and subsequent. Thirdly, and most importantly, and I, I think perhaps the reason why I was selected to chair this ad hoc committee is the education of fellow judges. When I became an appellate judge, I, I, I was talking to Sarah and I remember telling her that I was surprised about the un, what I call the unforced errors, judges, trial judges, who, and I'm sure I did it myself, who made mistakes because of the complexity of the sentencing laws on the books in Ohio and the reversible nature with which those, those decisions were made. And the, to, to start looking at perhaps how we can simplify that matter. You know, for judges and for our criminal justice system, information is our currency which reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, which is T.S. Eliot. And he said, where's the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Where's the knowledge we have lost in information? We live in a society awash in a sea of information without a viable means of distilling out what is needed to make informed decisions so that the rule of law applicable is applied in the sentencing of defendants in the administration of justice throughout the proceedings. I find it ironic that judges, and I think this gets to Justice Donnelly's point about those who oppose it, the irony of judges being reluctant to not want to receive as much information as possible. If, you, if you're a judge that has a bench trial, you want to know all the information because you want to make your decision the most informed possible. And that's what this data collection piece really achieves, I think. But it begs the question, how do you fix a system or improve a system which you can't measure? And the obvious answer to that is you can't. And in, when it viewed in this light, the collection piece is one of the, a, a number of points along the criminal justice continuum, which is now being impacted by data analysis. So it's not just unique to the sentence component. As uh, Chief Justice led the charge in bail reform, uh, I think two years ago now, Chief, perhaps, which culminated in criminal rule 46 modification and the encouragement for the use of risk assessment tools. That's just data collection on a, so, it, so that the bail decision is an informed decision. Trial court judges on a regular basis have, have expanded diversion, ILC, uh, deflection programs, all programs which address underlying either substance abuse, behavioral health issues, as it impacts the performance of uh, defendants both within the criminal justice system and, uh, and thereafter. We have ORAS analysis that is used by all probation departments in an attempt to determine what is the appropriate sentence that should be imposed. All of these are examples of, of using existing data to make the job of the criminal justice more fair, which is why we have the Sentencing Commission now poised to create really the database necessary for this sentencing data. And we start with the sentencing entry. Uh, and I'm happy to report that it is, uh, from my estimate, uh, finalized. Now it's a matter of how we implement that. And we're dealing with the Supreme Court relative to its implementation at this time. 
that will get us data. From data, then you have to figure out, well, how are you going to make it accessible? And to that end, what really needs to happen is the creation of a data collection um, platform. And I'm happy to report that the Sentencing Commission, in conjunction with private sector experts on data analysis from the University of Cincinnati, from Ohio State University, and now Case Western uh, Reserve just recently added uh, their support in aiding the commission, uh, the Ohio Sentencing Commission, to create the network for this data platform. That first question that you posed, Marissa, about misdemeanors, it's only for felony presently, but what it does is it creates the platform, the framework by which once accomplished, once you have the felony data uploaded or inputted, then that provides the mechanism by which, as you look at the far more diverse uh, and, and the larger quantity of misdemeanor sentences, um, you'll, you'll have the ability to do that as well. And that's, that's, where, that's where we, we lie. I like and close um, with what um, Justice Stephen Breyer talked about. He says, what does this rule of law mean? What does justice mean and all that? And he says, the rule of law and what we should strive to do as uh, members of the court is to fight against the arbitrary, to act according to what the law requires that you will not, and I'm quoting now Justice uh, Breyer, who said, you will not take people you don't like and throw them in jail, nor take people you do like and keep them out of jail. You apply the law as required to achieve the justice goal that is required of us as uh, Chief Justice indicated in remarks back in 2018 on bail reform, uh, Chief, you said the first duty of society is justice. This data collection piece, if implemented, will go a long way in achieving that justice. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Zamuda, you know, uh, I'm aware of some counties in Ohio that already collect some of this data in a structured electronic way. <clears throat> and uh, there's a question, there's been a few questions in the comment section about that. Number one, um, what efforts can be done as we construct this full statewide database to make some of the information that we do have available and public now in order to try to respond to the events of our time and recognize that perhaps if we were to go about making some of that data public that would assist and facilitate the public perception or, or, or assistance to move towards a statewide database? So the first order of business is to standardize the data piece itself. In other words, what are the pieces of data that everyone agrees should be collected, all right? And if there are communities that are collecting data, but not necessarily in the format, then there's a, there's a I, I think, a scientific question about how, do you, how can you conform the, the data that is being collected in such a way that it's readable, that it's comparable? You know, if Lucas County collects it one way and Cuyahoga County collects it a different way, is it really, isn't it really the same data? That's why this platform agreement that we have reached with um, Case Western and the, and the other universities to help create that platform, we'll look at that issue. It's not just creating the, the data pieces themselves, but we'll look at how one interfaces with the existing data structures that exist in the counties for those communities that are already collecting data. Well, I think we can, maybe we can open it up to some of the other panelists and uh, we'll get to Judge Hedden's comments in a second. But I think this does speak to, this larger question does speak to sort of the ability to have the political momentum to move forward. It's very clear that in, at least in some counties, you know, FOIA requests are routinely denied in this space. Um, there's been a really difficult challenge in a lot of spaces to try to get this, dat this data to be publicized. So what is the political capital that the Sentencing Commission could use before standardizing everybody to try to make this information public? Well, the political capital is actually the constituents that are watching this. Okay, we, because we live in a, in a system of 88 counties and we have um, 99 state representatives and 33 senators, the elective process is the mechanism by which I think we, we, we exert the political pressure that this is a standard and this information is something that is available 
and and actually, I don't think for that much money is uh, worth spending state resources to acquire. And I think the commission stands in the position to say, here's what it will cost, here's how we achieve it, and let's use private, let's use those private sector resources, those university resources, to help build that structure. So the political pressure, I think, comes to bear on our elective officers, uh, both the judge, both to the judges that you elect, because they're your judges. Every judge in Ohio, from Chief Justice O'Connor to uh, a municipal judge, right, is an elected officer who serves at the pleasure of those constituents. Exercise that right of vote and, and of asking um, input from your, from your judges, as well as all the other levels of, of the elective office. So is the commission in a position now to tell the constituents how much this is going to cost? Um, I don't think the overall cost is because you because that's what this initial framework that and platform uh, that we are working on in conjunction with the three universities. Uh, that money, um, Sarah, do you want to comment on that since that's under the sentencing commission? I want to overspeak uh, what you're doing or what we're doing. You're, you're fine. Thank you. Um, so let me back up a little bit. I think some of the work that needs to be done and the most important work is to start with a, a few jurisdictions and map that workflow. Because even though there are existing databases or ways to compile this information, I see one of the questions is about whether or not we've consulted with prosecutors offices. You know, there are systems at the local level where this information exists, but it's pooling those resources into one place and how best to map that workflow by jurisdiction, because there are 88 counties, just like Judge Zamuda said. So that's kind of the first step. And that we have um, applied for grant funding in partnership with um, the Ohio State University Drug Enforcement and Policy Center at the Moritz College of Law, the University of Cincinnati School of Technology, or Information and Technology, and the University of School of Criminal Justice to begin that process. Um, frankly, our grant submission was for an amount of $59,000 to start with a, a, a small number of courts to map that process and, and move forward. Um, I, I feel like, you know, one of the reasons that we haven't moved further in the conversation is people throw up their hands and say, oh, it's going to be $100 million and 20 years before you can do anything. And I just don't think that's true. I mean, I f our partners in the academic world are telling us that they think we can accomplish this um, to scale for a lot less than that and use um, existing databases and resources and, and just format them differently. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I I'm still back on the sort of logistics of it, you know, because we've got this we have these counties that collect their data. I mean, obviously the goal would be at the end to have one state database that each county could access with the same uh, sort of logistical mechanics behind it that would aggregate that information easily. And so I think what we're just saying, or what I'm trying to understand is, you know, understanding that the commission sees that this could be a multi-year process for budgeting reasons, for a host of reasons. What can we do in the interim to try to A, make this information public to the extent it is collected, and B, uh, work towards uh, you know, getting the, the counties who don't collect that data or aren't on a similar system now to start thinking about how they can locally go about making those changes so that when the statewide database is ready and it can go online, people are closer than they are now. This type of forum is a great way to start that conversation. I think part of the reason we haven't moved further in the 30 years, it's been a pretty localized conversation or right. one small conversation. I think what Justice Donnelly and, and Judge Hedden and the chief and everybody that's participating today is trying to do is diversify that conversation and roll it out to so that people are aware. I think Judge Zamuda said it correctly that most people don't even think about, well, what do you mean you don't know how many people were convicted of a certain type of felony? Or that you can't answer how many people didn't go to prison for a certain type of offense? 
or that you don't know where someone goes when they leave court. What's their disposition? If it's not prison, we don't know. And in today's society with Google and, you know, Justice Stanley is telling us to Google stuff as he's talking, one would think that you could just push a few buttons on the keyboard and come up with all of this information. And it's, I think, the public education part that will help propel the movement forward and the, you know, funding that's required. So we're in the early stages. I don't want people to think like, oh, we have this magic box at the sentencing commission office that's ready to roll out data. I mean, that's not it at all. <laughs> we're trying to be thoughtful and deliberative in how this rolls out. No, I think that's really well, could I just Could I just add to that? Um, we have uh, in Ohio, uh, you know, each court, uh, um, we don't have a unified system. And that poses some problems with regard to data collection and what can be um, uh, asked for uh, from the level different courts. And then you start with the another problem, which is different computer systems or different you know, records retention systems, uh, electronics um, across the 88 counties. And um, that poses a problem. So lack of uniformity, lack of resources, and at times lack of will have contributed to this problem greatly over the last 20, 30 years. And so that's part of the challenge is for uniformity and to have a central repository. That's why I'm you know, so grateful for the universities that are stepping up here to, um, you know, but, but I also wanna say Ohio is not alone in this. You know, I did a survey of state efforts uh, across the country and uh, there's, plenty of other states, uh, you know, the majority of other states that don't have a robust data collection uh, capacity and have not done it. Um, they've talked about it, just like we've talked about it in Ohio, um, but it, they fall short. And for many of the same reasons, they fall short. For their statistical analysis, you know, they can't have a statistical analysis because they haven't collected meaningful data in order to do that, and they haven't collected that meaningful data because the 88, well, here in Ohio, the 88 counties, uh, the 88 court systems uh, collect different data and the uniformity's not there to allow for the data collection to allow them for the transparency. Um, that's changing uh, and, and rightfully so, but you know, one of the problems we have in Ohio is we're not a centralized, we're not a unified system. Uh, there's some good thing, good reasons for that, um, and there's some shortcomings uh, because of it, especially in our data collection. This is more to the point. It, w let's say we're able to get a full sentencing database online. What's the enforcement mechanism for then going back to each of the counties and mandating their participation? I think that'll have to come from the legislature. I mean, I think the first step is to get all the bar associations behind this. And, and then uh, it may come down to a petition drive, but we need to convince the legislature that this is absolutely necessary. And more important, which will be more persuasive with them, it will pay for itself. Whatever money it costs to implement the system in terms of decreasing uh, what we pay for mass incarceration in the state, um, for nonviolent offenders, uh, who do not need to be incarcerated. Um, and don't get me wrong, no one on this panel is saying that there, for public safety reasons, there are uh, some defendants out there that need to be incarcerated. But if we have 50,000 people in, in, in the prison system, and we are constantly at judicial conferences interacting with the executive branch and the legislature branch, and, they're, and they talk about the drain on the budget that the, uh, the correction system uh, causes as a result of mass incarceration. Mercy, if I can give you an example just to show you the, the magnitude of the problem. When we first created this ad hoc committee, one of the first things we did is they said, okay, what is, what's the current feel? What, what do courts do? I know what we did in Lucas County as a trial court judge because I practiced there, uh, but I don't, know, I don't know what they do in Lake County or one of the other 87 other counties. And we, so we sent out a, a fly, we collected that information. We collected copies of judgment entries on sentencings. And somebody said to me, Judge, you're never gonna believe this. They said, what, There's, there, are, there was at least one county that handwrites 
hand writes the sentencing entry. That's not data input. That's no data, if you think about it. And then that handwritten sentencing entry is then sent to DRC for somebody sent to prison in trying to understand the penmanship of the judge saying, now, what does this actually say? So, so there really needs to be, and I, I illust this story illustrates in my mind, there needs to be a base analysis of the amount of data that isn't being collected that should. Okay, and then the analysis of how well the other communities that are, because there are some very robust communities that are doing an excellent job that could really be the stewards and lead us on our way to how to, how to run a statewide system. But there's also those counties, they're smaller in nature, they don't have the, they don't have the size of the, of, of the a computer system or the money available to upgrade and therefore they're getting by with what they've always gotten by with. And the question is, we have to raise that level for all votes to be able to say, this is the minimal standard. To that extent, and this is why I think the chief has taken such a, an aggressive stance in trying to say, this is where I, this is the hill I'm on now, right? Uh, because I think the Supreme Court, though, though the trial courts don't answer to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is charged with the task of promulgating rules of operation. And it's in the context of those rules that I think they can raise the requirements of what each court is required to collect and maintain and then deal with the legislature in terms of the, the, the monies necessary to allow those courts to accomplish that. It may seem intuitive, but that those data points would include all the things that Chief Justice mentioned at the beginning, like race, not just the sentence itself. It would have all the demographical information accompanying, correct? That, that's correct. The, our, our current data uh, data points that we have as it relates to this standardized sentencing form that we're promulgating it has well over 100 plus points of data, wow. including biographical information. Great. Judge Hiding, I want to make sure you get into the conversation, please, uh, your remarks. Thank you. You're on mute. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Um, I think it's important to kind of uh, uh, process uh, all the uh, communications at this point that have occurred. Uh, it, it's been years uh, since this has uh, been uh, initially presented. In fact, I was in communication with uh, Judge Ron Adrian, uh, and uh, as the Chief Justice had indicated, uh, this has been a topic of conversation uh, for over 25 years, uh, and and. And it's basically what uh, Judge Samuda just said as well. Uh, when I came on the bench, uh, it was about recognizing a need. Uh, and it was through the leadership of the Metropolitan Bar Associations in Ohio uh, and, and others, uh, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, Toledo, uh, but especially the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, through their thought leadership committee that will get this uh, issue out into the public uh, uh, domain. And that is why it's a statewide effort. That's why it's a statewide consortium right now of all of the metropolitan bar associations, because in essence, there is so, it is far easier to sit on inertia than anything else. And that is really what has occurred as the chief justice has said very frankly, and I appreciate the honesty, it is inertia. Uh, and in essence, what is necessary, therefore, to uh, avoid inertia is that uh, the poll here needs to be taken, but it also needs to be uh, uh, taken elsewhere as well. We need to make sure that there is a grassroot uh, level of support that is necessary to make sure that the inertia doesn't happen again. So uh, again, one of the things that is happening with this new pand pandemic is that we're able to do things electronically to show the influence on state legislators to enact the laws that have been basically part of our legal system. And I will get into that uh, for over 25 or 30 years. It is easy to understand why it didn't occur, but it is not easy to understand why it will not occur after uh, George uh, and all of the things that have occurred since then. So let me get into my remarks though, uh, because what I'd like to speak to you about briefly today is the cost of not having a database, uh, a repository. Uh, we're talking about costs related uh, uh, to a judge's sentencing are not often discussed 
as part of the criminal justice system reform. And he, I, I hadn't heard about it before I'd become uh, a judge. In fact, uh, actually, that was probably one of the things that we're talking about today, why it hasn't been discussed. It's not sexy, but there is a cost when unnecessary mass incarceration creeps into the system, when judges might sentence a person to a crime for years longer than other judges in the same jurisdiction solely because there is a lack of information. And this is what I've called mass incarceration creep. It creeps into the system year by year. Somebody might get two years longer than they should have had because like they don't have the information that the average sentence was like, a, you know, two years younger amongst that particular jurisdiction. Creeping into the system are the costs uh, in communities the costs uh, that are paid by businesses uh, when they are not able to find uh, people who are capable of working because they are being warehoused in prisons throughout the, the state. And it has been that way for way too long as the Chief Justice has indicated. Similarly, uh, as, as Justice Donnelly said, 50,000 people, that's the size of Lakewood, have been sitting in prison forever and are sitting right now. Every year, there is more and more and more uh, effort to make amongst businesses, uh, finding people who have felony uh, uh, sentences who are able to work. It is an issue. What we're doing right now with the, uh, uh, the reduction in mass incarceration through information and data uh, is a cost that is paid by Ohioans in terms of like their communities where black males are no longer in the family uh, and not supporting their children because they're in prison, uh, because they have longer records than they need to have. Again, no one is saying that uh, we are taking away from uh, a, uh, a judge the ability to, ju uh, to sentence as he or she pleases. That is absolutely the law of the land uh, and it will not change by having data. But what we do fundamentally believe is that having data will allow for people to be able to have a mechanism to accomplish that which the law requires. Uh, and that law is 29, 29, 11, and 12. And I wanna quickly just kind of jump into that uh, very quickly because I think that we can talk uh, in abstract, but really what has occurred, and this is important uh, in the term uh, in communications uh, with the Ohio General Assembly, is that this law is already in effect. Uh, as Justice Donnelly and I have shared on many different occasions, 29, 29, 11, and I'll go ahead and just share my screen and get to that document, hopefully. The purposes and principles of felony sentencing have been in place forever. I mean, really, I, when I say forever, I'm saying many more years than uh, uh, all of us have been uh, sitting on the various benches that we're sitting on. It says that a court that sentences an offender for a felony shall be guided by the overriding purposes of felony sentencing. The overriding purposes of felony sentencing are to protect the public from future crime by the offender and others to punish the offender and to promote effective rehabilitation of the offender. And then most important to our conversation today, using the minimum sanctions that the court determines accomplish these purposes without imposing an unnecessary burden on state and local government resources. There is a, a budgetary cost that is being paid as well when we don't follow the law in Ohio. So judges need this information. How will you know whether or not the minimum sanctions are what they are without data? How will you know whether or not you're imposing an unnecessary burden on state and local government resources without data? It's funny that it hasn't been discussed before, as we've said. It's really interesting. It's part of why data, in my mind, is the solution to systematic racism and institutional racism. Here we have the law. The law speaks for itself. The General Assembly has spoken. And for some reason, we're here talking this afternoon. Go to uh, subsection B. A sentence imposed for a felony shall be reasonably calculated to achieve 
the three overriding purposes of felony sentencing set forth in Division A of this section, commensurate with and not demeaning to the seriousness of the offender's conduct. No one is trying to say that people don't need to go to jail. There are seriously people who need to go to jail. We, there are victims of crime. But these victims, but the felonies that are being committed, the law requires that it has to be consistent with sentences imposed for similar crimes committed by similar offenders. Why haven't we had data? Again, I'm African American. I would say that potentially there are a reason why that's part of the reason why all of that has occurred this year. That is institutional and systematic racism. So ultimately what we need to do is to uh, uh, do what number C says. A court that imposes a sentence on an offender for a felony should not be based upon race, race ethnic background, gender, or religion of the offender. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Thank you, Judge. Um, if you would unshare your screen so we could go back to the main view. Very good. Appreciate that. We do have time um, for several questions that have been submitted from the audience, but I also wanted to take an opportunity to ask the panelists um, whether you think that there was anything about the sentencing database creation that hasn't been covered as of now that you'd like to add before we move on to the questions. Okay. So um, there have been several questions submitted and a lot of them have to really do with the ability to require the data to become public. So, and I maybe asked in a different way, um, there have been many challenges through the court system and otherwise in the court of public opinion to making a lot of this data public prior to today. For example, in Cuyahoga County, I know this has been litigated. Prosecutor's offices, the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office collects this data um, and the courts have already stated that they don't believe that the, the sentencing data that is collected by the county should be made public. So how do we, as we move forward again towards and transitioning to this statewide system, how do we change um, perception beyond, you know, the voters, as Judge mentioned, or, you know, placing public pressure to really, again, stress the importance of the fact that the, this information should and needs to be publicly available both to judges and to constituents. Well, I was reviewing some of the chats and a lot of them mentioned how this, a lot of this information is available in major metropolitan areas, uh, Cuyahoga County, Franklin County, and that's true, but um, it is so difficult to compile that most defense lawyers, I think would attest that they don't have time or the resources to put together, as Judge Zamuda mentioned, sentencing memorandums. I think every trial court judge in the state would love to have a sentencing memorandum from each advocate in each sentence, sentencing hearing. Um, but just to give you an example, I spoke last week to uh, a lawyer, Diane um, Menashe from Ice Miller in Columbus. And this is an anecdote that I think perfectly uh, describes why this is needed. She, she was representing someone uh, on an involuntary manslaughter and uh, she found out that the state had intended to uh, advocate for a 13 year sentence. Now she intuitively thought that that was way out of line with what other similarly situated individuals uh, had been sentenced in Franklin County. So she spent painstaking 25 hours worth of research to compile the, the, the necessary data to put together in a sentencing memorandum. She was able to show the, the sentencing judge this is way out of whack from what is normally asked, asked for. Uh, and she, as a result, she was able to keep that sentence down because judges, when they're shown the information, judges want to be fair. If you're going to treat someone different, you better have a good reason for it. And, you know, this is good. People, you asked in your preparatory uh, questions, uh, Marissa, that what about prosecutors? Well, this is going to be decent for, this is going to be valuable for prosecutors too, because prosecutors should have a, a device to keep consistent on what plea agreements they're offering. Who are they offering to them and why? And so that they are consistent and they are not offering pleas that end up with uh, racial disparity in sentences. Prosecutors in our state 
have a lot of tools in their tool belt in the plea negotiation pro process that are used to negotiate pleas, mandatory sentences that can be removed during the plea negotiation process. And so, and, and one other point I don't think uh, that we may, not only will it affect uh, more fair sentences, but it also provide our legislature the information to make policy decisions. I foresee a discussion on uh, what, once we look into the data and how mandatory sentences are used in the plea negotiation uh, process, there'll be a discussion in the legislature, are these useful? Do they have any use? Do they deter crime as we, we told our constituents when we pass these mandatory sentences? So policymakers need this information to provide good laws and to make sure that the laws that are on the books are effective. So um, hope I, that answers uh, your question. I think it does. And it, it's also a question about accountability. I mean, it's sort of implicit in everything that we're saying is that if the data were to be made public, then constituents could evaluate judges sentencing trends for themselves, which I think is part of what Chief Justice O'Connor was saying is the reason why the pushback is real amongst prosecutors and law enforcement and judges because they don't, they don't, they're afraid available to their constituents. So how do we shape that conversation to get insiders less fearful of the repercussions of the information and what it might reveal and more focus on the big picture about why this overarching need is necessary? I think it's how it's framed. I, I think we don't, we point out to every stakeholder involved that this is not uh, being advocated for as an implement, as a tool to expose, although if it does expose it, we know there's a problem and it needs to be fixed. And like you said, public officials need to be held accountable. So, uh, and, and that's what transparency uh, does. But I, I look at it prospectively. It's gonna provide every stakeholder with a tool to be consistent and follow the tenants overall uh, principles of our sentencing uh, guidelines as Judge Hedden outlined in his presentation. And, and Justice Donnelly, as um, uh, I, I said in my remarks, uh, this is not at all intended to uh, uh, limit uh, the ability to judge for judges to sentence as they please. Uh, you know, information can be used, uh, you know, both positively uh, as, 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 all the way through. I mean, it might help prosecutors and plea negotiations. It might help judges. Uh, it might also uh, give judges the basis for which they say, you know, I'm going to send to someone 12 years longer than the average person. Uh, but then all of a sudden, it becomes useful. Uh, and it's not arbitrary, uh, as uh, Judge Shemuda said. Uh, and so ultimately, what we're talking about here is simple. Uh, it's fairness. It's justice. It's the words uh, that are the fundamental aspects of, of why uh, this system, uh, this institution uh, of justice is so important. It goes across far beyond just criminal ju justice. If people don't think they're going to get a fair shake, uh, and if we allow for this to happen to the least uh, or to criminal defendants, I mean, what happens when uh, someone goes to court for their domestic relations or where they go for housing court or where they go for, because like literally it demeans the entire system when fairness is in debate. Uh, and this database will allow for fairness uh, to be achieved in essence, because it speaks for itself. Ray Sips eloquent for the lawyers out there. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that came up in the panel, and maybe just to kind of put a finer point on Judge Hedden's remarks, I, I think lawyers conceptually understand why data and information surrounding sentencing affects the ability to correct institutional racism. But for those of uh, for those who maybe don't live this space the way we do, or don't have the legal background, can one or all of you sort of opine on why? information and statistics and that type of uh, concrete data
can assist in making reforms and changes to the criminal justice system in a way that creates an equal playing field for black folks and others, uh, particularly who seem to be disenfranchised the most by the criminal justice system. I'll start. Um, it, it, uh, and let me just tell you the story in Lucas County, um, because beyond this data, uh, sentencing data collection piece, uh, when I was a trial court judge, uh, I was involved in Lucas County receiving and then implementing MacArthur grant dollars to increase um, cr the criminal justice system with the, within Ohio. And one of the things we did is we implemented a risk-based assessment tool for bail. And in utilizing that, we addressed head on this issue of systemic racism within our criminal justice system in Lucas County. The African American population in Lucas County is approximately 19%, yet they make up about 56% of the individuals that are in our local jail. And what we were able to study is whether or not the system, the court system in managing those respective cases had any implicit racial discrimination. And when you looked at each prong along the, that continuum of criminal justice, you saw the disparity in those that entered the system because they were arrested. So they're arrested at a greater percentage than they represent in the population. Yet the manner by which the court processed and managed those cases and sentenced them, some to prison, some to community control, there was no disparity, all right? And so you still have that, that, that inequitable distinction, but it didn't rise, if you, uh, which helped explain for our community in Lucas County, at least, that the disparity exists in why is it that only 19% of the population results in 54% of the people being housed in the local jail pretrial. And that's where uh, the focus in Lucas County has been to try and create programming or to at least study that. But there's some solace in the fact that the system itself processed them in a benign or, 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 or non-racist uh, setting, which I think is, should be um, recognized as, as a, a, a fair system. So, so that's the story that I know in Lucas County. Uh, I don't know if that type of analysis is, is available in other counties or statewide, but it should, it should be examined, absolutely. How do you administer justice? It seems like a basic question that we should be able to answer. It's a simple question, but it's a really difficult question if you, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I think you mentioned uh, Pennsylvania as a successful model of implementing a statewide database. Can you share a little bit more about how uh, those states that have created a database for which Ohio aims to emulate how they went about that transition or you know any sort of lessons learned that we could take as we go on this journey yeah sure um we continue to work with other states and you know across the country there are about 25 other sentencing commissions that manage this type of information on various levels um the ones that are most successful that are kind of our gold standard quite frankly what getting back to what the chief said um not they may not be a unified court state, but they are guideline states, sentencing guidelines. And I saw one of the questions here in the chat about, so what do you think about implementing guidelines for Ohio, similar to the federal sentencing guidelines or other state guidelines? Yes, that would make it easier, um, but we feel like we can still use the way they have rolled out their technology to build ours there are lessons we can learn from guideline states and unified court states just as easily as anyone else. And we're also trying to pull resources at the national level from places like Measures for Justice. And um, I, I, I applaud our, our ad hoc committee work because we've been open-minded in trying to garner support and ways to achieve what we want to see happen. And so um, Pennsylvania is a good one. We've done a lot of work in looking at other states like Iowa. And as the chief said, um, we're not alone in this, but I think what we need to focus on most is not only the beginning part, but also the implementation part, because oftentimes that's where the breakdown is. If you don't monitor it, 
and implement it successfully, you've wasted a lot of time and resources. And I think we're seeing that in some states already. So um, we're taking lessons learned from those states as well. Yeah, I see in um, the Zoom chat, uh, Bill, uh, Bill and Dave, uh, Dave uh, Judge Matthias, uh, um, comments, uh, and I think that they're absolutely correct uh, about the fact that there's a lot of pressure on judges. Uh, and one of the things that uh, needs to occur uh, is that uh, we understand that, uh, you know, when we sentence uh, uh, without information, we're sentencing somewhat uh, people uh, whose crimes are not the worst possible crimes to a lifetime uh, sentence, like the Gwen case, where a 50-year-old woman or over 50-year-old woman was sentenced to 50 years. What does that mean to somebody then when you really committed aggravated murder and was nonviolent? It was a, you know, a, 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 a theft offense. What does that mean though? Uh, and this is what the judge should be able to say. I'm keeping my most important sentences, the longest sentences, those who really need it, who deserve it. That is what this is mostly about, is not necessarily preventing people from getting the punishment they deserve, but making sure the punishment is meted out fairly. And that's ultimately a great way of, uh, of responding uh, to people who are saying I'm soft on crime. No, I'm not soft on crime, I'm hard on crime. Thank you for that, Judge. I think that raises another question that I have been ruminating about, which is, you know, once the data is collected, um, you know, what are we going to do with it? For lack of a better way of saying it, you know, as an example, as it's been acknowledged in the comment section, but also, you know, many of us on this Zoom chat are former prosecutors, and we understand that judges can only do so much because once the prosecutor makes the decision to indict or to prosecute an individual case, and it's in the system, it takes on its own life form to a certain extent. And so, you know, in the vast range of reforms and criminal justice reforms that we bring up at this point, the, the sentencing part is sort of, you know, the data is the last part of it because the person's already in the system. And there may be some argument that the sentencing data would really be best used by the prosecutors who could start the process of thinking about what they're charging in the first place and have that data as a means to sort of go about evaluating that. So when I say, you know, what are we going to do with it? Really, I guess my question is, you know, how can we mandate or at least encourage other stakeholders in the system, not just the judges, but law enforcement, prosecutors, probation, appeals courts, to take that data and use it in a meaningfully way, in meaningful ways to create change? Well, absolutely, the data will be, and I can't overemphasize that, this is going to be important to every stakeholder, and it, especially the prosecutors who wield the most power within the criminal justice system. And they have, at, they have to be at the table in order to make this change um, applicable. And, you know, if there's a perception in a particular jurisdiction that a prosecutor is consistently overcharging a defendant, this data will uh, either confirm that or, uh, or disprove that notion. Uh, if, if, if crimes are coming into the system, highly charged felonies of the first degree, felonies of the second degree, but they're going out as misdemeanors with a, a consistent, a large amount of time, that, that's a question that needs to be asked. And that's gonna help prosecutors saying, we have to do something about this. We, we, this looks like we may be uh, overcharging in this particular case, and we're gonna adjust our charging process. So that kind of transparency is gonna not only help with the criminal sentence the judge, the judge ultimately imposes, but right in the front end, when the prosecutor uh, makes that you know, very important charging decision, that's gonna uh, be helpful to prosecutors as well. So Justice Donnelly, you mentioned in your remarks uh, the sort of delineation between the federal system and the state system and the federal government being a bit more involved on this issue in terms of their ability to access sentencing data. Um, but, you know, the criticism on the other side of that is that the federal system has abrogated a lot of power away from the judges through the federal sentencing guidelines, 
and um, the other you know, data that's available both at pretrial on bail issues uh, and you know, creating, they just, within the last few years, pretrial services created this uh, know, matrix where each uh, defendant is given a number about whether they're a risk to be um, released on supervised release or on bail, um, effective bail. And also at the sentencing commission level where on a federal level, they've really done a lot more homework about trying to standardize amongst the 94 districts, how judges sentence and give some information about that upfront in the sentencing memoranda and in the uh, pre-sentence report that the federal judges receive. And the criticism on the other side is that the judges feel as though they don't have a lot of power because the sentencing guidelines have, you know, even though they're not mandatory anymore, they've really created a very small window of opportunity. And those judges have federal lifetime appointments. Right. So how can we get elected judges to really buy into this when, you know, the federal system is sort of receiving criticism in a, in a similar way for being too standardized? I think the federal system has their own problems with the, with the guidelines, like you said, the judges have too little discretion if they feel they are bound by those. And if you look at the, those guidelines and what they uh, ultimately result in the sentences over there, it's just you know night and day compared to what's happening in the state system. And as a former trial court judge, you're not, not gonna hear me, I, anytime the legislature passes a law that takes away judicial discretion, I was always against it because that's, as trial court judges, that's what we use to uh, distinguish one case against the, the other, um, if, if, it, if it needs to be distinguished. You, if you have, if you're, again, getting back to that notion that you treat likes alike, and if they're gonna treat someone differently, there better be a good reason for it. So uh, the, going to the state system, all we're saying is we're providing judges a tool what, what now meaningful comparisons will be able to be made, their decisions, uh, and, and we will diminish that impression that uh, your sentence depends on which which judge you're going to get. Um, we just have to convince the, the, the trial courts of the state. Uh, you know, someone once said that discretion is the fertile ground for bias, implicit bias. If you look at the Florida study, the judges that were sentencing people of color um, with more severe sentences than white defendants, they didn't have reputations for being racist. In fact, they had just the opposite. They had fit reputations for being fair. But bias, we are human beings as judges, and everybody has their own biases. When we were preparing for this talk, I said to uh, the group, I said, you know, I was burglarized before I became a judge, but I had my home. And I, I wonder, going back, did that bias creep into my decision-making process when I, ever, when I had a defendant who had committed a burglary? I don't know. I didn't have the tools in order to keep my, that bias in check the way, the way we should. And that's what this, uh, this database will, will do for the state system. We have time, I think, for one more question. And this was another one that came up in the, in the chats. You could foresee creating a database where now, moving forward, criminal defense attorneys in particular would have access to this information. And then there would be a slew of appeals related to previous convictions. So how do we, is there a, 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 de a determination on the Sentencing Commission as to whether this type of data could be retroactively applied to matters that were already sentenced? And, uh, you know, if, if that's not true, you know, if the data is only available going forward, you know, how does that affect sort of the narrative about what we're trying to do here? Marissa, that's already happening. Um, there's a eighth district decision that Justice Donnelly was kind enough to share with some of us. Um, State v. Holly is at the was at the site, Mike. Yes. State v. Holly. Well, that's exactly what the trial court did, and and, and so you, you, what your question really highlights and, and points out is the is the extent to which true application of 29, 29, 11, and twelve. What does it mean? It gives it gives uh, specificity, and perhaps elaborates on what can be utilized in that, and that's what the what the appellate court, the eighth district appellate court, utilized in overturning. Uh, a conviction as a consequence of going through prior sentences. So it's not necessarily a retroactive application. It's a more informed or heightened analysis based on past practice of that court, of that particular judge, of other similarly situated courts with, within the state. 
So it's a, it's a more heightened or refined or informed discussion, and I think therefore more informed sentence. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much to Chief Justice O'Connor and our panelists today for participating in this very important dialogue that I'm sure will continue as the months and years move on as we try to create this database in the state of Ohio. And um, hopefully conversations like these will be the first step in really demonstrating to everyone the importance and necessary information um, that will, that, and the buy-in that's required to really get this rolling. Um, again, as I mentioned before, if you signed up for CLE, please be sure to look out for the email that there will be a survey attached that will require you to fill out in order to receive your CLE credit. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you all. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.